Okay, so uh, welcome back everybody. So this is the second uh, Bayesian uh, section. And today uh, we have Wei Yao, uh, who will be talking about the Bayesian analysis in uh, heavy ion collisions. And uh, okay. as usual, uh, uh, please uh, enter your comments or questions on the Slack and we'll be monitoring those. Yeah. Wei Yao, you can take over. Thank you. Uh, okay, I will first uh, share our schedule. Uh, can you see the slides? Yes. Okay. Uh, so so today is uh, uh, we're going to follow uh, Matt's introduction to the base uh, analysis yesterday, and today's will be uh, uh, mainly on on hands-on exercises. Uh, mainly applying this spatial analysis framework to uh, one specific branch of hybrid collisions to the, to the bulk physics model. And it will take uh, two and a half hours today. And there will be another session uh, uh, by, by Dan uh, tomorrow morning. Uh, the, the schedule for, for these uh, two sessions, uh, we, so, so because the final analysis is, is, is quite, uh, 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 quite quite complicated compared to simple examples that that you see yesterday. So so today, uh, we're going to gradually increase the complexity. Uh, first, we will have an exercise on the Gaussian emulators, which is briefly mentioned yesterday, and then we will apply the emulator assisted Bayesian analysis first to a toy model of bulk physics plus uh, pseudo data today, and then tomorrow uh, we'll use the the uh, this is uh, a very similar framework to the the real jet skip medium simulations plus pseudo data and maybe uh to, to the real data and, and the goal for this process uh first we we, uh, we, we will uh, uh uh go over some ideas on the reason why we're using the emulator and and how do we uh uh train this emulator so that we have a very fast uh uh, uh very fast predictor for the true physical models. And we want to understand <clears throat> the, the very important process of validation. Uh, basically, once we use the a model emulator to replace the true full model, whether we still get the desired accuracies for parameter ex extractions. And finally, in today's example, we're going to handle not just like one dimensional parameter space, but uh, actually the constraining of multi dimensional model parameter space by uh, multi-dimensional uh, observables. And it's very important how to understand these high-dimensional high dimensional posteriors. So these are the three main goals for today. And before we start, I will try to send uh, all the instructors and TAs that will answer your questions on Slack. They are there then, uh, also instructors for tomorrow, uh, Matt, and, and Li Pei from Ohio State. Uh, and Wen Kan Jeff from, from Duke University. Okay. Uh, before we uh, start the materials, uh, I will uh, again make sure that everybody has. Uh, let me see. So everybody has uh, already pulled the most recent. Uh, master branch of the Jetscape 2021 uh, 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 GitHub repository. Uh, and then after you start the Docker container, uh, just just as you 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 started the, the notebook previously, uh, and then go to this folder called uh, Summer School 2021, July 18th to 19th, uh, base Bayesian soft examples, and then open this. Uh, uh the this notebook pages uh while i let you uh do this i will kind of, uh go back to the slides okay so First, it's uh, actually a recap of the Bayes theorem. So, yes, so yesterday I have seen that uh, uh, 
the main problem we, we try to uh, address with applying the Bayes theorem is actually to, to do this inverse inverse problems that uh, given a model which predicts some observables add some input parameters and then make some, some measurements uh, and we want to update the knowledge uh, containing this new measurement to our prior belief of the basic distribution of the true values of the parameters before we have this new measurement. And this is done in this uh, Bayesian theorem manner. Uh, the posterior, the updated uh, distribution of the parameters is uh, equals to a prior, your, your prior belief times the likelihood function, which is the probability for the model with some parameters to describe the data when divided by the normalization. And such a normalization is also often called an evidence. Uh, and you have seen that uh, since this likelihood function is often, its exact form is often unknown. And commonly we just assume that it takes a multivariate form uh, of a multivariate, uh, it, it takes the form of a multivariate Gaussian distributions, uh, which involves, for example, the differences between the measurement and your calculation, and also another uh, uncertainty matrix, this capital sigma. However, this uh, this framework is uh, not always directly applicable. Uh, I mean, it's, it's directly applicable when you have simple models. So, so by simple models, I mean that the the model predictions is very easy to compute. Uh, therefore, uh, you you have you have some like a workflow like, like this. On the one side, you have the parameter space with some prior knowledge. You can uh, pull arbitrary predictions inside the parameter space by running it through the model to get the predictions and combined with some measurements, uh, you have a base theorem uh, which updates the, the, the posterior distribution of the parameters. However, whenever you have a model that is too complicated to generate the predictions, uh, which are usually computational, very intensive models such as those used for heavy ion collisions, uh, we have to take a, a detour before we apply the base theorem. So because these type of models are usually very expensive to run, uh, the best we can do is actually to run a finite set of models, uh, predictions on, uh, on, on, on a carefully selected uh, 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 list of parameters. So we only run this model on some discrete points. You, you sample uh, some parameter sets from the parameter space labeled by, for example, labeled by I and get the predictions. And to use this, finite set of predictions uh, to interpolate the entire range of the parameter space, that's where, that's where the emulator comes in. So emulator serves as a very fast predictor uh, of the observables given an arbitrary set of parameter space uh, in the prior. Uh, and and it, can, it can do so because it, it, uh, it, can, uh, it can train on the finite set of data that you provided it and kind of predict, uh, pro pro provide you a uh, uh, interpolation through through this discrete uh, data set. Uh, of course, we can make this uh, process more efficient uh, because often a model doesn't generate just only one output. It generates a, a vector of output. For example, in heavy ion collisions uh, with one shear viscosities, you can compute observables like uh, particle multiplicities for different particle species and V2, V3, V4, and so on. So uh, the dimension of this output, this y vector is very high and it's not very efficient and, and, and unstable if you, if you just build one separate emulator for each of these observables. And we know that these observables are not all independent. They're, they're strongly correlated. For example, you, if, if, if you increase V2, then there's a very large chance you're also going to in increase V3 due to some change of the parameters. And if you have a total charge multiplicity being tuned up, uh, then, then the pion multiplicity are, are also going to be tuned up, for example. So we can make use of this uh, correlations among these data sets, uh, the, the different observables systematically, and do what we call the dimensional reductions. So basically, we, we, uh, we will find a new representation 
for these high dimensional vectors. Uh, and, and this new representation is another vector z, but the, the, the advantage that is that the dimension of z is much less than the dimension of y. For example, to you, you only need one number to, inc uh, to, to represent the increase of pi multiplicities and the charge particle multiplicities simultaneously, instead of using two numbers to track their increase uh, sub uh, independently. So, so this is just a very crude analogy, but uh, you will see how this is done uh, like systematically by using some uh, existing packages. After that, we'll only use emulators to learn how to uh, uh, interpolate these new features, Z, and we can always uh, transform this Z back to the real space. So therefore, this emulator assisted Bayesian workflow will look like this. So after you train in these emulators uh, with this data reduction using the final data set that is generated, uh, in the final base uh, application, uh, you, you can get a very fast prediction of the observables uh, in the parameter space by going through this detour. You don't have to run the full model anymore. Uh, use the emulators to get the predictions and then compare it with, it with experiments. Okay, so at this point, I'll pause uh, for any questions for this general outline. Uh, otherwise, we will go to uh, a first exercise to see the, the, the use of an emulator. Okay, let me see. Okay. Okay, now I hope you have already uh, put the most recent uh, uh, commit to the, to the GitHub. Uh, and and uh, just raise your hand if you have uh, problems doing that, or you can ask me in the Slack channel. And once you have uh, opened the, 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 the Jupyter notebook, you will find there are, there are three notebooks. <clears throat> the, the, the two for today are one of them. The first one is this, uh, what we call the simple Gaussian process dot notebook. And the other one <clears throat> used later for today is the base for simple model. And now please, Click on this simple Gaussian emulator. Okay. And if you run through the first block, it should display uh, the, the entire block in, in a wider style so that you can see it better. And when you ask questions, please uh, refer to, to these numbers, uh, to, to the TA, so that they know where, where you're at. OK. And then this first block is just uh, uh, in includes some, some uh, libraries that we're going to use, uh, and also some, some very useful plotting function. But it's really not important for you to look at this plotting function right now. I'll just go through it. And this is the main material. So the Gaussian emulators uh, is a non-parametric way to interpolate uh, interpolate the data that it provided. It's uh, it's essentially a, a bunch of random functions conditioned to your specific requirements. So so let's first look at what an unconditioned Gaussian process is. So unconditioned pro Gaussian process is just a random function. So, so to specify random functions uh, using languages maybe closer to the, to the physical uh, context is that you specify the one point function, the mean, or the two point functions, the, the covariance functions of, of this function. So, so by the mean, you, you after take down sample average, uh, this random function will give you some average quantities called mu of x. And the covariance functions takes uh, measurements 
uh, uh, away from the mean at two points, and uh, the ensemble average gives you this. Also, we call the the kernel uh, is the correlation at the of the value of this random function at one point x and another point x prime. And then this is just two point functions, and we assume that arbitrary number of uh, collection of the functional values will form an n-dimensional normal distribution uh, with the, the above mean and pairwise covariance. Uh, this is still quite abstract, so let's see some concrete examples. Uh, of course, simple case is a single uh, Gaussian dis a, a single variate Gaussian distribution. Uh, here you only have a one uh, one variable x with one parameter mu and a standard deviation sigma. Um, and to go to multivariate Gaussian distribution, uh, the mu is, of course, characterized by a collection of values uh, at the points that you're interested in, for example, x1, x2, and so on. And also, this if the value at these different points are uh, further specified by how they correlate it, if you give them this uh, covariance matrix, uh, uh, with some some criterions to to ensure the the positivity. For example, for for two two variable uh, two, two two variable Gaussian, uh, I've read out the, the explicit uh, uh, probability density over here. We have some normalization that depends on how they correlated, and also this uh, this argument uh, that depends on <clears throat> the differences from the mean and also the inverse. Covariance matrix. Uh, so not we are not we are not interested in every possible Gaussian distributions. We are interested in a specific very specific form uh, of the Gaussian distribution with the following correlation functions. So the correlation function that we're interested interested in often takes uh, qualitative features like this one. The two input points x and x two are very close. Uh, they the the functional values at these two points are highly correlated, and when they are far apart, they are uh, more or less non uh, uncorrelated. And for example, uh, a, a, a very common function that satisfies the criterion is this uh, another Gaussian form, or what we, we often call the the radial basis functions. Uh, or, or square exponential functions, it's characterized by a C parameters and a correlation lens. So the C parameters tells you how strong uh, the autocorrelation is, and this correlation lens tells the typical separation you have to go to uh, in order to decorrelate the output at two input points. And again, this uh, this form of correlation function, the the most important feature is that whenever you have close input, they are going to have uh, close outputs. So the following block, this block number two, uh, is basically a, a visualization of the, what this kernel function looks like. Uh, here you can see you have uh, two input points and two parameters, a C and a length scale. And if you run through this block, it should generate a figure like this. Uh, in this case, we generate uh, 11 random variables with uh, input points x uh, uniformly spaced from minus one to one. Uh, they have zero mean. Uh, oh, okay, this is uh, not important right now. But the covariance matrix, uh, for this 11 by 11 uh, matrices is generated using the autocorrelation strength one and the length scale equals to one. And, and this heat map, uh, this heat map will show you how, how uh, the matrix element looks like uh, with uh, one variable to input points. So on the diagonal, you have the autocorrelations, which give you uh, correlation strength one. And when they are far apart, the correlation strength decreases to zero. You can also try to, for example, change the uh, uh, change the correlation strength. Let's see what it looks like. Oh, in 
this case, you all will also have to change the maximum of the plotting function. Qualitatively, well, it looks the same, but quantitatively, uh, all the points are, are increased by a factor of four. You can also try what happens if you change the covariance lines to be much larger than minus one to one. You change it to ten, then essentially all the data points are correlated with the with the same strengths. And with a very tiny correlation lens, like 0.01, essentially you're going to get uh, auto correlations, and any other correlations will quickly drop down to zero. Okay, now we'll set it back to our default values. Okay. And in block three, it directly applies uh, the mean and the covariance matrix that we defined to generate an uh, ensemble of n-dimensional normal distributions. So this ND normal functions uh, inside, I just called the, the, the default a multivariate normal function, uh, no, normal, normal random variable generators from the NumPy package. We just pass it with what it means, what has covariance and how many like samples you want. And then it will return to you the, 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 the samples. And let me see. So we will generate a thousand samples with the default parameters one and one. Uh, and it's a, and, and each sample will contains a size, size 20 random vectors. And to, to see the output, uh, here you can specify, for example, in this 20 dimensional vector, which, which, which pair of uh, variables you want to look at. For example, let's look at the, the, the joint distribution of random variable number one and number two. So if we run through this block, it will generate this uh, to the uh, joint distribution function. It's, it's, it's this function, this hist 1d2d is the one that we find at the very beginning of this notebook. Uh, it, it, so so in, in, in the center, it, it, it shows you the the, the two the, the, the two dimensional scatter plot of the uh, oh should really be y over here because we're plotting the value of the output. So this is the output of uh, y at x1 and y at x2 and on the sidebars you have the uh, marginalized one pra uh, one variable distributions. So each of these variable, variable distribution will look like a Gaussian, and, and because we're right now choosing two adjacent points, they are highly correlated. You can also see here they have this label is uh, that shows you the uh, separation between the two points that you choose over the correlation lens. So so not right now this this uh, and this number is much smaller than one means they are. Uh, very close, measured by the correlation lens. So you have this tightly correlated if, uh, 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 scattered plot. And now we're going to choose another extreme. We're going to take the first data points, sorry, first input points, and the second input point, we're going to choose the last one. So they're separated by almost, uh, I think, almost four units of uh, correlation lens. So now if you run it, again, the marginalized distribution, uh, this, this still looks like a, a, a Gaussian distribution, but the joint distribution now becomes essentially factorized between, uh, between the two, meaning that you, you don't have uh, any visible correlated structure uh, that the distribution of y1 is not going to strongly depend on the, the specific value of y2. Okay, so, so that's basically what the covariance matrix does, as we expected. 
Now there's another way to represent because as you see, we can only really see uh, like two like two 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 parameter distributions at a time. Uh, but another way to see this multivariate normal all at once is to plot that twenty input points and their realizations on the x and y axis as a scatter plot. So if you run through block four. On the left, it will generate uh, the first five realizations that we that, that we sampled from the twenty-dimensional multivariate normal, and you see that they kind of look like very smooth functions, as they should be, because the the this, this type of covariance matrix will require that the two input points are close when they are close in in, in input values. So that's so. So if you take the limit, that that's uh, how one defines, for example, continuity. So this uh, so when you represents uh, the, the 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 random vectors that are generated from the random fun uh, multivariate normal in this way, uh, you realize that this this type of objects can be used can be viewed as the random functions itself. And on the right is the uh, marginalize the distribution of these random functions over that 1,000 samples that we generated on each of the input points. So let me add the label. This is x. And this is clear. And, and and here you, you see the mean is almost zero, as we said, and and, and this band will correspond to sixty percent, ninety percent, and ninety five percent credible in a, a limit, where it contains, for example, ninety five percent of all the samples. So that's the the, the distribution of an unconditioned uh, Gaussian process. And to make use of these random objects to our purpose, for example, to interpolate other functions uh, at some, some, for example, finite data set, uh, what we do is to, to, to define the condition Gaussian process. Uh, so we don't really have uh, the, the time to go into the details uh, of the condition Gaussian process, uh, to go into the detail of its mass, but you're encouraged to, for example, Google how, what the condition multivariate normal looks like uh, and also look at, for example, the the documentation for the sklearn package that we're going to, to use in a minute. Right now, we're going to implement the so-called condition in, uh, in in a literal sense. So, for example, we want to use random functions to interpolate, for example, three points. The first one is minus two, minus one. The second one is 0 0.5. Uh, the third one is two and 0.7. And we have to define uh, what, what, what the accuracy we want this interpolation. So, so basically, we want, we want the Gaussian process to come very close to the points within some resolutions. And this resolution right now I'm choosing point one. So in block five, we will first generate in this time, this time, a hundred thousand random functions <coughs> with. Uh, Autocorrelation one and <clears throat> covariance lens two. After that, we will apply the filter. So this filter will will try to only pick those random functions that we generate that satisfy the following criterion. So basically, the first point of output uh, should be very close to minus one. The second point should be very close to sorry. The, the tenth point should be very close to my uh, to, to point five. And the last point at two should be very close to 0.7. And then after we filtered out, uh, so this, this filter we I call it cut, and you can find that this filter is applied here. And if you run through block five, and this is uh, what you get. So so the black dots are the three conditioned points 
start with Putin. So so uh, and, 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 and the red functions are the first five samples that generated in this hundred thousand random functions. And the blue lines are those that we picked out that only that, that passes through these condition functions. And now we see that this uh, this blue functions they kind of all uh, have the same trend and uh, generate what uh, our brain tells us is kind of like interpolations through these three points. But it's actually even better because uh, in in those po in, in in those places where you don't have any data, they actually don't just give you a single prediction but a spread of predictions. So this can actually be used to estimate uh, because we are, we know that this this distributions of the random function values is also Gaussian, another Gaussian. So so this distributions is width can be used as a, a very important interpolation uncertainties when you use this interpolator in, in the Gaussian pro in, in the Bayesian analysis because we know in the Bayesian analysis every uncertainty should be taken care uh, very strictly. So so now all this looks very good, but we're only using one very particular set of random functions with such uh, covariance matrix parameters. Now, if you try, for example, a different covariance lens, for example, try uh, one, for example, a shorter covariance lens, and rerun this block. So here's what you'll see. So when, when you decrease the, the covariance lens, uh, you, you, of course, because we impose that, uh, we, we impose that, that constraints, so they still pass through uh, these this three black points, but now they get uh, they they start to have a larger spread uh, in between two data points where we don't have data. So there's no, for example, a, a prior knowledge on how exactly should we choose this uh, this covariance lens and also, for example, this uh, 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 this this variance. Uh, they are essentially called the hyperparameters in the Gaussian process. So, so hyperparameters means that they are not really uh, physical parameters in our model, but they they came in when we try to interpolate uh, inter the, the, the data. Uh, but of course, we we don't think that all of them, uh, all of this different choice of the hyperparameters C and the correlation lens are equally likely using some physical senses. For example, if you use a very small coarse lens, uh, this interpolation function gets uh, violently oscillating in between of these data points. And if we believe that uh, our physical model should always change smoothly, then it seems that such a, a choice of correlation lens is not likely to happen. So this is where the training process comes in. So the training process is actually to optimize uh, these hyperparameters, this C and this autocorrelation strength and the, the covariance lens. And there may be even more uh, uh, hyperparameters when you use more complex uh, co co kernel functions to, to generate that covariance matrix. Right now we only have two. So, so the training process is to systematically tune in uh, the C parameters and the, the lens parameters to balance between uh, whether they can uh, successfully interpolate between uh, the three data points and also the complexity of the interpolation. So by complexity, uh, you can roughly understand how much oscillation there is in between points. So, or, or like for example, effective degrees of freedom between two fixed points. Okay, uh, by the way, uh, let me know if you have any questions. I will change it back to one and two, which are actually eyeball fits that kind of pass my criterion. But to really implement the training process, we're going to use uh, the 
uh, very special uh, specific implementation of the caution process in this sklearn uh, a second learn uh, package so so second learn package comes with very good tutorials and also examples and uh, actual code examples so you're very encouraged to uh, click on this link if you have time and look at the, the a full description of the usage of these two modules uh, but right now we're going to apply it to a very simple problem basically interpolate or infer the functional form of fx using a finite number of data points so this function is uh, x squared plus sine of 5x five, five uh, you can also try other functions uh, at your own time and see when does this well, when, 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 when does the Gaussian process break if you give it some some very weird functions for example uh, so if you run through block six it will plot what this function looks like and what what measurement we made so so this function will contain an oscillating piece and also a, a quadratic piece uh, but we are only going to make six measurement within minus one to one this is this 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 finite number of measurement is uh, we, we call it design so so, so right now it's not a problem to, to, to choose the design points because this model runs instantaneously. But once you go to realistic physical models, uh, you have to really carefully choose the design points to have a, a good representation of the whole parameter space because uh, many physical models to generate each of the design points will take you thousands of uh, computing hours. So you have to carefully design these points. Uh, right now there are six points, which kind of tells you there's seems to be an oscillating behavior in the data set. And then in block seven, we're going to uh, import uh, the corresponding uh, packages. The first one is the kernel functions. Uh, sorry, the first one is the Gaussian process emulator uh, or the Gaussian process regressor uh, from the sklearn package uh, we have a short name for it is uh, gpr and the second one we import is the, the kernel functions so the kernel functions is the it, it, so, so the kernel function is basically that we want to use a specific one of them which is the gaussian form we have been playing with and, and here you, you can uh, define the kernel. So 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 in this uh, uh, kernel uh, in this kernel packages, uh, this type of function they call the radio basis functions. Uh, so this kernel dot rbf radio basis function. Uh, and and here are some initial guesses of the the C parameters and the length scale. The initial guesses are r one, r r ones, and we can tell it one it try to optimize uh the length scale parameters what is the maximum range of uh lens we wanted to vary because the data is kind of like uh, well behaved within minus one to one so so we, we don't we don't think that this cover this length scale should be really different from unity so we impose it to be varied from 0.1 to 10. and then it's the training process so the training process, uh, so, so first we, we, we define this Gaussian process emulators, uh, tell it what, what type of kernel function to use and how much number of optimization we want to perform to optimize its hyperparameters, just in case it's got uh, stuck in some local minima. And finally, we, we will call this fit function uh, and tell it uh, tell, tell this Gaussian process basically the, the constraints. So the constraints that at these design points, uh, it should come very close to the, the calculations. So basically come close to these six points. And then 
if you run it, it will print uh, the parameters after the optimization. So first is the, uh, the C parameters. It's about 1.05, not far from one, because as you can see from this uh, data set that we generated, uh, all the Y values of these functions are spread on the order of unity. So this auto correlation strength is not surprised that it's very close to one. Length scale is uh, 0.3, again, not, not very close to order unity. Though there are two more numbers print out. They are the, the scores of the, the, this training process. So, 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 so this, if the score is one, that means that the training is successful, uh, but only successful for the training data that we gave it. So as you can see this, the score for describing the training data is called gp.score and pass it the design value and the uh, output. So, so it successfully de de almost describe all the points in the training data. But to prevent that there are overfitting problems, we're also going to test more points. So this here, I define even more points, uh, sample uniformly from minus one to one, 37 points and see if the Gaussian process also described this new new points very well. So, so, so this time I pass it the validation point, we call it validation points, xv, and also the true function output at these points. So that's what this second line is doing. The score for describing the validation data is also very close to one, but not perfect. So, uh, but, but this is very important because often when you result in an overfitting uh, problem, this the, the score for describing the validation data will be very low. So that's that's how you know there's some some problems going on in in, in, in the training process. Okay. And then. Uh, to, to see what, what this Gaussian process looks like, we can call the Gaussian process dot predict functions. Uh, but here I, I rewrite it into a, another wrapper uh, called predict. You, you, you pass it the, the value where you want to make the prediction and the, the trained Gaussian process. Uh, as I said, the Gaussian process not only just give you the mean, but also the variance at the, 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 the the prediction point. So, so we can use the, the standard deviation as a prediction uncertainties. So that's block eight. And then in block nine, <clears throat> and then in, in, in the final block, it basically uh, generate another vector of input and use this predictor and the trend Gaussian process to get the predicted by value and uh, the standard deviation of the prediction. And we can compare it with the design points, the true function, uh, the mean of this uh, uh, random function interpolation, and also, for example, one sigma and two sigmas error back. Uh, okay. So, so, he, so here's the interpolation results. Uh, it, it, it looks very like the, 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 the this, this uh, very naive uh, conditioned Gaussian process that we applied before. So basically one, 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 one the prediction come very close to a training data, the uncertainty gets smaller. And in between the, 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 the training data points, uh, because this has lesser information, the, you, you have a larger spread of the the prediction uh, and, and but 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 again this spread is you you know that there's a, there's a final uncertainty because it also predicts its own interpolation uncertainties and in this case uh, the mean predictions this blue dashed lines is actually not far from not very far from the actual true functions okay. 
So let me know if you have any questions because we're going to make a few variants of this result. Okay. Oh, I see someone. Is... Okay, now if you. Okay, I see your question is uh, Is there a way to know the functional form of the Gaussian? Uh, the I think you mean the the condition Gaussian, the meaning of the Gaussian process. Uh, yes, this, this mean is known. Uh, for example, we can look at the formula. I think I think there's one in the... Uh... Okay. Uh, or you, if you, we can Google the conditioned, conditional Gaussian distribution. Because this is the multivariate normal, and I think there's a section uh, on the condition distributions. So, so here you can see, uh, for example, you have if you have uh, some some training data, uh, for example, Q training data, sorry, a minus Q training data and, and, and Q values where we want to interpolate, and then you, you do have a, like a closed formula for how to construct the mean after the, the condition process. Uh, but but like I said, we were not going to get into the full full masses. Full, full math of, of, of this process, uh, but, but both this uh, sklearn package, the documentation, and, just, oh, and also just the documentation of multivariate normal distribution will be very useful because that's essentially the mathematical tool over here. And now if you go to, uh, go back to, Block six. So so currently we're using six points to train uh, uh, to to train the emulators. So you can try what happens if you change it to to lesser points. Uh, I will give you a few minutes to do this on by yourself. For example, four points or, or just five points, and see if you can still get uh, a nice interpolation. And maybe you can let me know in, in the in, in the pool when you when you are done. Okay, see one person where you responded in oh three person. Oh we have four, five. Yeah, I see the number is rapidly increasing. Very good. <clears throat> okay. So probably didn't see uh, a nice interpolation because I think six is the, the number that I find minimal to, to generate some reasonable results. So I will run it 
over here. Yeah, you get you get something like this. So with with just for example five design points. Remember, it's it, we 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 used to use six. So so why 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 does this happen? So so if you look at the the true functions, it contains many features. For example, there's first a, a drop down and then about about two cycles of oscillations. And to really faithfully represent so so. So to really physically represent these true functions, you need a certain level of, shall we say, data taking. Uh, if you only take one point in the extreme, then, then you are never going to learn the full picture of these functions. So, so Gaussian process is not always uh, like magic that it, it just gives you the, the true functions. But, but the, the nice thing is that although we have quite large deviations uh, between the mean and uh, the, the true values, the true values are still con contained within, for example, the one sigma band. It's just in this case, the, the uncertainty is, is, is huge. And you can also kind of see this when you're training, when, when you, when you train the Gaussian emulators. So, so, rem so remember that it's very important to always test uh, <clears throat> The predicted power of the Gaussian process. In this case, the validation data gets a very low score. So, so this is also not very surprised that uh, other than these five points, other points are not described so well by the by this emulator. Of course, you can change it to for example eight design points. Uh, in this case, uh, you have a better representation of the oscillation behavior. Repeat this process. Yeah. And, and then you, you have an even better uh, constraint uh, emulator than, than, than the first one that we start with. So the lesson for this is that uh, it's, it's really important to make sure that you have enough design points before you train the emulator and use this as a template. Although you're still going to uh, estimate these uncertainties, but you, you, you are going to lose a lot of accuracy if you don't have uh, enough uh, uh, design points. In fact, in many of these uh, high dimensional interpolating functions, because you, you, you really have very limited number of samples in the high dimensional parameter space, the emulator uncertainty is often one of the dominated sources of uncertainties in the in, in, in the in the base inference. Uh, I think there's another question. Yes. So does this Gaussian emulator provide good extrapolations? Uh, what happens when you make predictions outside of minus one to one? So here, so in block block nine, uh, we we can only make predictions from minus one to one, which is limited by the lowest and the highest uh, uh, training points. Uh, you can try, for example, increase it from minus three to three and see what happens. Yeah, because it's just, just one block, I will, uh, I will not leave it like the uh, exercise. Uh, so, so, so here as you see, uh, outside of this uh, training domain, uh, this emulator uh, start to deviate really, really far away from from the from from the true functions. Uh, but of course, this doesn't mean that Gaussian emulator cannot make extrapolations. You you can make, for example, uh, future projections or extrapolations, but but that will require some very specifically designed uh, covariance functions. For for these very simple covariance functions. Uh, that we use right now is not uh, optimal for making uh, projections. Uh, when the one 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 input points, for example, x equals to three, is so far from all the training data, then it essentially decorates all the informations and will simply return the the prior distribution. So, so I, so at, at x equals to 0.3, you're basically go back to the unconditioned random functions that you started with. Okay, so 
uh, ENDS suggests we can take, uh, for example, five minutes break. And meanwhile, you can also ask questions on Slack regarding this first exercise. Yeah, that sounds good. Okay. Yeah, we can come back at uh, 10 33. Okay. And uh, please ask questions on, on Slack. Oh. So there's actually one question from the working team. Thank <laughs> you. 